Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Get Stalked podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about player profiling and why it's so important to do that, especially now with the new landscape of online poker. Like it or hate it, PokerStars has switched to a new form of multi-tabling where you are only allowed to play at four regular stakes tables at once. The players who used to play 16 tables at once are no longer a threat anymore. At first, I was upset for a grand total of about 25 seconds, and then I realized exactly what this meant for online poker. The days of being able to just click play are officially over. They were going out of style, kind of like fighting in hockey, but it is officially done. You cannot afford to sit there, pick four random tables, and just go. Because you don't have 12 other tables making up for any losses at one anymore. You've got four shots. It's more important than ever to sit down and actually pick the right tables, the right positioning, and the right opponents to pick on. So I'm going to break this down super, super finely and work my way up. The first thing you have to do is gather information, whether it's by watching hands or using a heads up display if you have one, or even observing a few tables before you sit down, you have to gather information. And there's actually four ways to gather invitation. There's direct information, which is when there's a showdown and both players were forced to, you know, show their hands. The second form is direct voluntary information. This information is not as reliable as the first. That's because if somebody chooses to not muck a hand or chooses to show the hand during a fold, they did that with some psychological intent. Was it to give the other person an emotional high five? Was it to put them on tilt? You don't know, but that information is not completely honest, so you need to think about that. The third piece of information is inference. So if you see somebody's bet under the gun three times in a row, and they happen to show up with aces one time, and the other two you don't know, unfortunately, that's a fluke. The reason why that's a fluke is because everybody's going to be betting under the gun with ace-ace. Nobody limps under the gun with ace-ace. So that doesn't help you build any information because that's common knowledge. What does that do other than reaffirm that they're raising with aces? Of course they're going to. It's, it's strategy. So what you need to do is really sit down and go, does this guy continuation bet on 100% of flops after 100 hands? If that's the case, then maybe you can sit down and go, okay, now I'm on to something. It takes a long time for inference to become reliable information. So the one piece of information that people try to use is inference with categorization. That's basically labeling players. There's tons of ways to do it. Phil Helmuth, how he does it is he calls people by poker animals. Nathan Black Rain 79 Williams, he does a regulars slash recreational system where he goes, these people are regulars, these guys are bad regulars, these guys are recreational, these guys are crazy. You're sitting down and you're categorizing people. How I personally do it is I have a 1 in 10 scenario. Is this person a 1 out of 10 poker player? Are they a 7 out of 10 poker player? Are they a 3 out of 10 poker player? It doesn't matter the point is is I'm categorizing them the problem with categorization is people sit down and they think that they know exactly what they're doing because they saw two showdowns and they went I know what I'm up to that's gonna bring you nothing but failure you have to be able to acknowledge that you can make mistakes because it happens. I've miscategorized people as eights when they should have been fives. I've miscategorized people as ones when maybe they should have been fours. It totally happens. You have to be honest with yourself 
and just go with the fact that you're learning and you're going to make mistakes. Okay, Brandon, why did you go on that tangent? The reason why I went on that tangent was to say when you have a system of categorization that you're comfortable with, whether it's Phil Helmuth's animal example, whether it's Nathan's rec reg system, whether it's my 1 to 10 system, no matter what, once you have these categories or representations of players set down, you need a strategy for every single one of your categorizations. I don't care if you make a hybrid between Nathan's and Phil's. I don't care if you do a hybrid between mine and Phil's. I don't care if you do a hybrid with mine and Nathan's. In fact, I'd be flattered because they're both professional poker players who know a lot more than I do. But the point is, is you need those game plans. Are you going to play a 1 out of 10 the same way as a 10 out of 10? Are you going to play a lion the same way you're going to play a fish? Are you going to play a recreational the same way that you're going to play a professional? Of course not. Of course not. And these categorizations are not meant to be perfect. Just because a person's 7 out of 10 doesn't mean if they double barrel, I necessarily believe them. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes your categories are fallible and you have to fall back on common sense. If somebody 3-bets you from under the gun, no, they can't 3-bet you, I'm sorry, 4-bets you from under the gun, Chances are they've got aces or kings. I get it. People bluff. It happens. But especially on the low stake games like one cent, two cent, two cent, five cent, and even five cent, ten cent. If a very, very tight player is four betting you from under the gun and you have queens, I'm sorry that at best it's a coin flip for you. It sucks. It's a reality of the game. You have to use common sense sometimes. If you have kings and they 4-bet you, it's still not the best scenario in the world because you blocker two of the kings that they have. So you can go all in and pray they don't have aces. And that's completely fine. Do what you want. It's just about making the smartest play you can, and that's why people categorize other opponents so they can continue making the smartest plans that they absolutely can. Because the point of poker is to make the best decision possible, and player profiling is going to do that for you. Before I wrap up, I want to give a couple of examples. Let's say you go with my system, the 1 out of 10 system, where 1 out of 10 means you're a bad player and 10 out of 10 means you're a very good player. If you've dedicated to this system and you have game plans for this system, then if you sit down at a table and you see three tens, two eights, and a four, sweet, there's a four. But there's also four players there that you have decided oh damn, they're pretty good. Do you want to put yourself in that kind of situation, especially now that you only have four shots? Of course not. Table selection is so important now, I can't begin to express it. When I see there's a bunch of people who I have identified as good, even if the biggest fish on the stake is at that table, why would I sit there right now? I can acknowledge that I am not going to be the best player at that poker table. My pride will not get in the way of me making the right decision. Do I really want to wage war by trying to steal blinds against two guys who identify as a 10? No. You know what table I'm going to sit at? I'm going to sit at the table where there's an 8, two 6s, a 4, and a 1. That's where I'm going to go. And if I see a waiting list that's two or three people long, I'll wait. I, I've got nothing better to do. If I have to sit at a table because there's one ten and nothing else is open, fine. But the second a good table opens up, I'm sitting out and I'm jumping to that table because I'm not, not, not spending 25% of my hands battling against guys who are just more well-versed than I am. And why should you? I get that maybe people who seek out poker podcasts, poker videos, are probably in the top 10 of poker players, top 10% of poker players, where they're trying to gain a bigger edge. I get it. 
And if you're one of those, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new. But to anybody out there that's a new poker player, if you think you're at a table with a lot of good players, chances are you might not be the best of that table and you might even be the worst. Why would you put yourself in that kind of situation? It doesn't make sense anymore on poker stars. You have four shots, and if you want, you can go play Zoom for your fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth shots. Poker stars doesn't care what you do. They're putting fringe players like me and other fringe players in a position where we can succeed now. Cash outs are amazing. If you have 85% equity, you can pay 1% to take 84% of the pot right there. I take it more often than not because if I lose, cool, I just want an extra three bucks. Why would I risk $8 to chase $1.36 left? It doesn't make sense to me anymore. I'm gonna take the cash out every single time I can. And I know I'm tangenting a little, I get it, but the cash out just incentivizes more bad players to make bad plays where you can trap somebody into going all in against you with a flush draw when you have a set because they think, oh my God, worst case scenario, I can cash out for three or four bucks. And then you sit there with a set and then go like, nah, bro, I'm taking 90% of this pot right now. If you want to gamble, go for it. You need to put yourself in those situations where you're going to succeed because not putting yourself in those situations is officially inexcusable. You know what else is inexcusable? Not posting for two and a half months. I get it. Why would you listen to me? The only reason I'm even posting today actually is because I just had a really good conversation with a poker player called Nathan Williams. You might know him as Black Rain 79 one of the best microstakes players to ever play. And it all started when a couple months ago I posted my first video about the $100 to $10,000 challenge. I had downloaded his free resource about crushing the microstakes, his 50 page no BS guide to crushing it. And after I read that book, I immediately got a little bit better. So I made a podcast talking about it and then I enrolled in some poker courses like the Upswing Poker Lab, and I read a couple books, and then I noticed that my game had actually dropped a little bit. And it wasn't those resources' faults, they're very, very good resources. But basically what I was trying to do was use culinary school experience against guys who are McDonald's regulars. I know it sounds weird and not very flattering, but why would you use your experience to cook the perfect souffle when you're being told to make McDoubles? It doesn't make sense. Nathan Williams' guide was the best way to make McDoubles, and he made fortunes making his McDoubles. And I added him on Instagram, and he actually commented on my post. He goes, good luck with the podcast, everything like that. And it just really, really, really like connected with me because I was like, oh my God, this guy who's living my dream just actually commented on one of my posts and wished me good luck, which was amazing. So I ended up registering to his newsletter and a month and a half later, I actually bought his playbook on how to crush the micro stakes. And after reading at least a little bit of it, I started crushing again, and I realized for the second time that why do I need to bring my culinary experience when I'm trying to make McDoubles? Right now, two cent, five cent, one cent, two cent, maybe even five cent, ten cent, those are like minimum wage ish ways of looking at poker until you can graduate to these higher levels. And I'm not trying to dissuade people from going to seek higher education. In fact, I'm still going to learn from the Upswing Poker Lab and everything like that. But just his guide on, you know, playing at these micro stakes really, really helped me. So I decided, you know what, screw it. I'm going to message him to say thank you for the book because it's helped me immensely. And he actually messaged me back again going, um, hey, you know what? I'm glad that you're finding a lot of benefit from my book. 
if you ever want any uh, uh, help, let me know, is basically what he said. I'm paraphrasing because I don't want to out him too much. Um, but he encouraged me to keep doing the podcast, even though I am essentially a nobody as a poker player. And I should use it as some sort of tool to progress and just document my learning experiences with you guys. And... I know it sounds weird, but to be pushed by somebody who's living your dream, how could you not listen to that, you know? And it just means a lot to me that somebody in his situation who didn't have to be nice to me, he didn't have to be, nobody forced him, that he went above and beyond to encourage nobody to at least give it a shot. And for that, I'm so appreciative. This is not a sponsorship by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, if there's ever a sponsorship, I will let you know immediately that I will be the first to sell out. If Dollar Shave Club comes over and tells me to sponsor one of my videos, you better believe I'm going to be preaching about Dollar Shave Club. This was completely my own experience with Nathan that I just wanted to share with everybody else and just to thank him for pushing me a little bit harder to pursue a dream that I have. So thank you, Nathan, and thank you to the audience for listening. My name is Brandon Stolk, and good luck at the poker tables.